Hey, welcome back for another video once again about WWDC 21. Last video on Tuesday, I showed you what were my highlights of WWDC. And this time I want to show you what are the highlights of the iOS community. So what I did is that since Tuesday, I've been on Twitter. I've bookmarked a few tweets from what I think are familiar faces from the community. And basically, I want to show you what these people are excited about. So first tweet is from Donny, who tells us that he's super excited about actors and is showing us an example of how actors look like. So it's basically a before and after. So first we have a class. So a class that basically caches objects. We can see that the cache is implemented with an array of items. And of course, in such a type, well, it's not thread safe. So if several threads try to access an instance at the same time, it could corrupt the class, corrupt the array, lead to a data race. And when you use actor, so actor is a new keyword introduced in Swift 5.5, well, you no longer have to worry about this because actors, they protect their own state against data races. Basically, it's like if all the state in the actor had some mutual exclusion implemented for free. So that's a pattern that is going to be, I guess, super useful in Swift in the future. Now, next, we have a series of tweets from Paul Hudson that shows us all the cool new features from Xcode 13. So the first one we can see behind me is that whenever we are using a tag that requires an import, here, for instance, a view, well, the import is made automatically. So it's not going to change the world, but it's one of these things that are going to streamline our development process. Another nice addition is that, as you can see, when you try to unwrap an optional using an if let syntax, Xcode is now able to generate even more code for you. It can now generate the name of the local variable that will store the unwrapped value. Another addition that is super useful is that now when you are switching over an enum, Xcode is going to automatically generate all the cases for you. So if I'm correct, Xcode could already do it, but you had to do like some uh, extra command using the refactor. Now it seems to be the default option, which makes a lot of sense because most of the time when we have an enum, well, we actually want to have a switch that deals with all the possible cases. Okay, so this one is kind of cool. It's whenever you are iterating over a collection. So here the collection is called names. Well, when you write a for loop, Xcode is able to generate for you the name of the local variable in the loop. And it uses a singular of the name used for the variable of the collection. So here we have the collection names and the local variable is called name. And I've seen some other example from Paul and it seems that it even works with some agreements that are irregular. So I guess if you've seen the session what's new in foundation, you've seen that there are some improvements in the way that localized string deal with plurals and this kind of thing. So I'm thinking it might be the same code running under the hood, but it's super impressive. For instance, I think if you make an array called teeth, well, the local variable will be tooth and Xcode can generate like this code, even though it's an irregular agreement. So super interesting to see this feature in Xcode. I remember seeing it uh, in Android Studio a few years ago and liking it a lot. So seeing it coming to Xcode is super nice. And finally, the last expression that Paul highlighted is the fact that now autocompletion can actually deal with sub properties. So here, if you take a look, we have the variable some text. Then we use the autocompletion to access the corner radius and it works even though corner radius is not directly a property of some text, but rather a property of the layer of some text. So autocompletion now works with sub properties. Now moving on to a completely different topic, which is SF symbols and the fact that the version three is out. So there are some exciting things. For instance, as you can see, there are a lot of new symbols, but what's even more exciting is that there is a feature to do color customization. So as you can see in a symbol, there are, we could say, several layers basically that can take a different color. So for instance, if you look here at the thermometer, you can see that the sun is yellow and the content thermometer is red, but you could also have just everything be the same color. I think it's going to be super exciting to see how these icons are being used because now basically we have a way of having, well, default icons that make sense for everyone, but we can also customize them so that they feel at home with uh, the look and feel of any application. So it will be interesting to see how designers are taking advantage of this feature. Okay, so for this one, I'm not sure if it's for real or if it's just for fun. But as you know, now in iOS, you can copy and paste text from an image. And what Guy Rambo did is that he showed that you can actually do this with code. So if it works, I think it will be super interesting, especially like for people who attend conferences and that want to 
copy and paste code from a picture that they took of a slide on a video projector. If this works as well as it seems to be working in this image, it could be some very, very useful additions for developers. Then we have a new property wrapper that has been added in SwiftUI, which is, as you can see here, at focus state. And at focus state, basically, the way I understand it, it's kind of the same thing than the first responder API in UIKit, meaning that, as you can see, the variable annotated with at focus state is a field, and then on the text field, we can use the modifier focus, pass in this focus field, and from what I understand is that the variable will hold the field that is currently in focus. And from what I understand, you can also programmatically set the focus on a specific field. So it's basically the first responder API implemented in SwiftUI, and I think it will be super useful to make, well, forms that are going to be like more interactive and that have a better user experience. Then we have John Sandel, who has already written a few really cool articles on how to use async await in Swift. And as you can see here, this article, it focuses on using async await with the new method that have been added in URL session. So the use case of downloading something or uploading something to the network is super common among iOS app. And I think John is absolutely right in the fact that it's probably the best way to learn and to try and create some practice with async await in Swift. Then we have Josh, who is telling us about a nice little addition in Xcode 13, which is the fact that now Xcode can actually automatically manage for you the version and the build number of your app. So you no longer have to manually update this value in your info.playlist. Xcode can do it automatically for you. And I totally agree with Josh that it's super nice that Xcode is finally able to automatically manage this data for you. Here we have Antoine that is pointing that there was some update on the App Store review guideline. And it's the fact that now if an app supports account creation, it must also offer account deletion directly into the app. So it's a nice addition from the point of view of the user experience, because if you have to go to a website to delete an account you created using an app, it's just a bad experience. But if you are an app developer and your app does not offer this feature, well, you might want to prioritize it on your roadmap. Otherwise, you will probably run into trouble in the future. And finally, we have Donny that is telling us that the async global function that is used to create a task with the the new Swift API concurrency and that we can see being shown in the WC session is actually already deprecated and will be replaced in the next betas. So for people who have used Swift UI version one, it might bring back some memories of APIs being deprecated early on. So here it seems to be a minor change, but I think it's still a nice warning that if you were planning to convert some big part of your app to async await, well, maybe wait for a few weeks until things stabilized. This way you will reduce the risk of having to redo the work you have already done. And that's all for this video. So as you can see, there have been a lot of cool stuff announced this week, a lot of things to be excited and a lot of things to study closely and to keep us busy for the next week. But we are also super lucky to have a very active iOS community with a lot of people who are really following what is announced and that take the time to share with us what they are excited about. So if I had one advice for you is to go and check out the Twitter account that I've shown in this video. They are great people. They know a lot of interesting stuff about iOS. So I can only recommend that you go check out and follow the Twitter account. Thank you for watching this video and see you next time.